So this is a presentation on the subtalar joint uh, basics. So the first thing to understand is the terminology as we move into the foot is going to start to change. At the Taylor curl joint, we were still using internal and external rotation to describe axial rotation around the y-axis. But now, as we move into the uh, hind foot and talk about the movement between the calcaneus and the talus, we're going to start to use terms abduction and abduction. Plantar flexion and dorsiflexion will stay the same, but then we'll use, we'll also change in terms of frontal plane, what we used to call ab and abduction as motion around an x-axis, we're now going to call inversion and eversion. This is a nice drawing of the hind foot. We can see the tibia forming the ankle mortis with the fibula. So here you have the kind of square ankle mortis that forms the ankle joint. And then we can see underneath the talus here, we can see the subtalar joint formed between the talus and the calcaneus. And that's the focus of this talk. So what we want to do is understand how the talus and calcaneus articulate with each other. And we're going to use this picture to motivate that. Essentially, this is a picture of the superior aspect of the calcaneus with the talus removed. And the head of the talus would be sitting here, connecting to the navicular. And then the inferior surface of the talus would sit on top of these three facets um, that make up the superior aspect of the calcaneus. So we see the posterior facet on top of the calcaneus here, a middle facet, and then a really tiny anterior facet here. And so the talus has corresponding facets that sit on top of each one of those uh, facets of the calcaneus. You can see they're flat, and so this is going to be classified as a sliding, uh, have sliding gliding joint, but there's going to be one axis, and this approximates the axis here. We'll talk a lot more about that in a minute. But that's going to, um, uh, each one of these plane joints kind of works together to form a, a hinge joint. So there's only really one degree of freedom at the, uh, at the subtalar joint. So the key uh, ligaments of the uh, subtalar joint are, is really the interosseous calcaneal ligament with really a minor role of some other ligaments such as the calcaneofibular ligament tibial calcaneal part of the deltoid ligament and parts of the capsule that get labeled in some studies are really not as significant. The key ligament really is the interosseous uh, talocalcaneal ligament. And we can see it here. Here's the talus cut halfway through. So this is the trochlea of the talus here. This is the posterior facet of the calcaneus and sitting just anterior to that between the posterior facet and middle facet are different bands of the interosseous talocalcaneal ligament, and we can see that here. Now, movement of the uh, subtalar joint doesn't occur in the anatomical planes of the body. Essentially, the axis is oblique to those planes. And so what we can see here is the axis of motion is tilted uh, superiorly from a horizontal um, about 42 degrees. And so, essentially, instead of having pure inversion-eversion motion, here what we would normally uh, call that for the foot, um, we get kind of a mixture of eversion-inversion motion and um, rotational motion. And that's what we would call abduction in the foot. Now, the other piece of it is if we look at the axis orientation from a trans in a transverse view from above, so here we have the superior view, we can see that it's not just deviated in the sagittal plane, but it's also deviated medially 16 degrees. We can see that represented here. And so essentially there, because of that, there's a slight amount of dorsiflexion, plantar flexion that occurs. But the majority of motion uh, because of the axis orientation is some combination of eversion, inversion, and abduction, adduction.
we can see in the superior view that the axis orientation is very close to being almost directly anterior posterior, um, therefore giving us a lot of eversion inversion motion. So to review again, we're going to call pronation a combination of eversion, extra rotation, and dorsiflexion. And we can see the axis orientation oriented here in neutral. So we know that the, since it's a hinge joint, it only has one degree of freedom and motion is going to occur around that single axis. And we can see here this as we move the foot into eversion or laterally. Okay, we, we can note that it's also going to be associated with abduction and a slight amount of dorsiflexion. And so many times because the axis though is so closely approximated um, in this transverse plane um, to uh, uh, anterior posterior axis and because what we view is the posterior heel, a lot of times people interchange the word eversion and pronation. But it's more correct to say pronation because pronation represents really all three components where eversion just focuses on one. Now for supination, it's the same situation, only the other direction. And so we can look here, so now we're rotating uh, the rear foot um, toward a supination position or medially. So we notice that there's a strong inversion component, some amount of internal rotation, and slight plantar flexion. So here's a, a demonstration of that motion. Uh, here and the first thing you notice is that there's three times as much inversion as there is eversion and in fact there's only a slight amount of eversion sometimes limited to only around uh, 10 degrees or less or we have 22 to 30 degrees of inversion. Now this is an important study that documented in vivo the shapes of the complex of the ankle, meaning the uh, malleoli, the talus, and the calcaneus. And we, they used MR images and, um, in vivo to reconstruct the shapes of these various bones. And if you study them for a minute, you can notice here that this talus is markedly different than, say, um, this one or here. And with different bony features, um, are really um, not consistent. Some that stand out are the sustenac and tailey here and here. This is quite large, um, which helps form the middle facet of the uh, subtalar joint. And we can see the um, different shapes of the tailor head here and here, here, um, and then also the posterior uh, facets here, here, and here. So given these differences in anatomy, it shouldn't surprise us that when we go to examine patients that these anatomical differences are going to manifest as uh, strong differences in the range of motion that our patients present with. So it's a general rule that they'll have uh, usually three times as much inversion as eversion, but the actual magnitude of eversion could be quite small. In some cases only a few degrees, in other cases 10 um, degrees or slightly more. So the key points are that the subtalar joint forms a hinge axis, that each uh, facet is a plane, would be classified as a plane joint individually, but together they function as a hinge joint. The oblique axis uh, is out of plane from the anatomical planes that we're used to using for uh, describing joint motion, and the alignment of that varies based on the anatomy. And so the clinical implications are that when mobilizing the subtalar joint and examining subtalar joint motion, it's important to remember that the axis orientation likely varies, so the movement plane will vary some, and the range of motion will vary normally from individual to individual. So it's important when comparing range of motion to compare the involved side to the uninvolved side and use that as your standard rather than a concept of normal average. So now we want to apply this information to something functional like walking. And this is a study from Cornwall and McPoyle which looked at the amount of rear foot motion 
meaning subtalar motion that's used during gait. And they defined the motion as really only focusing on the eversion inversion component. So they neglected to look at the internal external rotation or abduction abduction element of foot pronation and supination. Nevertheless, it gives us a good estimate of how the subtalar joints contributing to foot movement during walking. And they identified out of hundreds of subjects two patterns that really accounted for over 90% of all the different uh, patients that participated. And it's basically this one typical pattern or prolonged pattern. And we can see them here, where in general, both most patients then or participants started in about four degrees of inversion. Um, and then across the gait cycle, so we have heel strike here and toe off here at 100%. Across the gait cycle, they move from inversion to slight eversion, where the prolonged group actually went into a greater eversion and stayed there longer. But then both returned into inversion, um, exceeding their starting values in, in both cases um, as the foot came off the ground. So we can see that there's this function of the foot is uh, connected to a, an inversion landing position. It moves into slight um, eversion as we uh, get to the mid stance and then returns to inversion at toe off. And we can also, if we think just for a minute, we can also reflect on how much a range of motion we have during gait. And so we know that in essence we have much more inversion in terms of just range of motion in general than eversion. And so if we look here, we're using slightly more in inversion, but as a percentage of the total we have, it's not very much. So if we have 20 or 30 degrees of inversion, we're only using six, um, five to six degrees of that inversion during gait, versus if we only have five degrees to 10 degrees of eversion, here we're using two to three degrees of that. So we're using three of 10 degrees of our eversion motion. So if we have, it's essentially, um, we use a higher percentage of our eversion motion just during normal gait than we do inversion. So what you'll notice is as we go to transfer this information to clinical situations, it's going to be much more challenging for us to restore. If we lose eversion motion, then it's more critical. It's more, it affects our gait more much more than if we lose inversion motion because we have much larger inversion motion in the first place.